Savannah during the Civil War. And when they meet with, for, for, excuse me, with Sherman, they said only one of we were cracking teeth for we. Again, Gullah, crack your teeth me to speak. They said only one will speak for all of us. So Frazier is the one to point to speak to Sherman on behalf of all those other 19 ministers. So what then happens is this. Sherman asked Frazier a question. He said, what does the Civil War represent to you and your people? And that's what Frazier says. How can you expect a man who has gotten wealthy off of us to treat us as equals? He said, it's going to take years to correct. He said, we must have land. We must have land so the old men will work it, the women will work it, and the children will work it. He said the young men will sit and fight in the war. Sherman is so impressed with how very you broke down the Civil War represented the African people. He now issued something known as Special Field Order Number 15, better known as 40 Acres on a Mule. Some people talk about the concept, they always represent Sherman. I'm talking about this is the man right here who got the concept that gives it to Sherman. But Frazier also tells Sherman as he said that we will be able to take care of ourselves and have a surplus. What do you mean by having a surplus? They will be able to engage in business. So now they're conveying to people that this war is no longer about just having freedom. It's about having independence and autonomy. Okay, well. There are three oh. things that affect black communities across the entire United States. Mm -hmm. Public housing development, interstate highway system, and integration. Integration caused us to stop going to the business in our community and start going downtown, out to the mall. Mm. We see the decline of black businesses in the black community. And um, people in the Atlanta area know about I-75. I-75 will wipe out parts of two black communities in Macon, Georgia, known as Pleasant Hill and Washington. But it doesn't stop there. Then it goes to Cincinnati. And in Cincinnati, it wipes out part of Over the Rhine and Lincoln Heights in Cincinnati two historic black neighborhoods. But then it doesn't stop there. Then it goes to Detroit, and it wipes out Hazel Street in Detroit, which was their economic center, their black Wall Street area. People say, Black Bottom, Jamal, I said, that's right. And I-94 wipes out the Rondo community in St. Paul, Minnesota. See, no matter what we are, say, our story is the same. Just that what happened, developers, they use a template on all of us. And they bank on us not talking to one another. I tell them, when we begin talking to one another, we can make changes. We can make our way. I tell folks, I call it I 70 Baltimore, I 70 Baltimore, I call it the interstate to nowhere. Because I 70 in Baltimore just wipes out a black neighborhood, then it just stops. People say, Jamal, they got rid of our neighborhood. I said, that was the purpose of it. So that's why I say, as long as we talk to one another, we can defeat them. We're going to cut off the street because it's more from Baltimore over here. I'm all right, see y'all radicals and stuff like that, all right? Good job. <laughs> This is North Marcus, so the historic first Bryan Baptist Church, which is the oldest continuous black church in North America. Now, y'all might be saying, wait a minute, I thought we just saw it. That's the fifth location for First African. This is the fourth location. The historic first Bryan, historic first African, all one church at one time. Split in the congregation in 1832. Because they got the two prophets. One will keep the property on Franklin Square, other will keep the property here in Yamacraw. So let's y'all look at the historical marker. And when you said 4,000, that includes this church as well, mm -hmm. you said 4,000 members. Well, right, church. right. Because what occurs initially, all of them together, and it's like over, over 2,000, 2,000, 4,000. Then when they split their numbers, both of them go down there, and few of them remain right there. The overall majority remain there. And there's someone on the market, people talk about his concept all the time, but don't give him credit for it. And it's fitting for us to be here right now for Historic First Bryan Baptist Church. The land that we're standing on right now is one of the oldest pieces of properties owned by black folks in all of North America. I ain't say Savannah, I said North America. Caribbean, Mexico, U.S. and Canada. This land's been in black hands since the 1790s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. This might is dedicated to the first pastor of both churches, Father George Lau. Father George Lau and Mother Hannah Lau will support the British during the American Revolution. It goes to the first of the Bahamas, then it goes to Kingston, Jamaica. There in Jamaica, they start the first black Baptist churches in Jamaica. And I have black Baptists out of Jamaica, and Ross is going to say, man, I'll start tied to Savannah through George Lau. Because again, they bring what they call Ethiopian Baptists there to Jamaica. And so again, and so this mine is right here by Black Baptist groups from around the entire country. That's why you got the state's name on it. Now on here, his name is spelled L-I-S-L-E. Generally, his name is spelled L-E-I-L-E. -E. I can't explain to you why in 1960, they misspelled his name like that. This is the newest square in the city of Savannah. Again, this is the newest square in the city of Savannah. 
Now, when I share this with some people, and I said this little square, so people do a compare and contrast. They see the squares over there. Those squares are 200 years old. This square, 2006. The grass that's in the square right now has been in this square for approximately just over a year. Just, oh, just going on a year right now in the past three and a half years. The fountain that's functioning right now, the fountain that's functioning, has only been functioning over a year now in the past three and a half years. The benches that are right here in the square have only been here just going about two months right now. And so uh, I'll tell you what happened. When we did the dedication in square 2006, the statues here were stolen. Not by the people here. Two weeks after we did the dedication, the statues were stolen. Not by the people here, but other people took the attitude, how did y'all put bronze statues in, this pro in the project? How did y'all put a square in the project that the people here are not beholden? Tap of this part, the snowball effect is going to get even greater. In fact, what happened November 20, 2020, I got two people with me out of Savannah on the journey. On Saturday afternoon, we come out here, they see basically there's no grass in the square, they see the slates are up, they see the fountains not functioning, and Miles Fell said, Jamal, this is not right. And so, what happened that he's been on the city of Savannah since November 2020, and some of my brothers up here at his story, Brother First Brian, did not basically bring this back into being. And so I'll let y'all know this. We're really not a tour company. We're actually a history company involved in human rights work. So we, we plant the seeds that are powerful to bring about change. So that's why I occurred. So like I said, we're going to get a little greater. We're going to make our way. And Yamacraw's name for one of the three Native American groups in this area. And the Yamacraw, the Uchi, and the Yamasee. The Yamasee were on the South Carolina side of the Savannah River. That's why we have Yamasee, South Carolina. And the Yuchi people, we still use their language. They're from a place called Tybee, Tybee Island. It means salt in the language of the Yuchi people, Salt Island. So over here, you can see some of the history of historic Yamacraw. And here you see historic first Bryan Baptist Church right here. Everything else has been torn down. You see the black dirt. See, I stand about the black dirt right over here. Over here, you see children going around a Maypole on a May Day celebration right here. And then over here, you see African American boys with the chimney sweeps right here. You see the European history over here, see the Native American history over here, y'all see it. <laughs> it's been ongoing damage to the square from 2006 up until September 2021. Yeah. So what the deal is this, what you want to do, you don't want to empower the people here. You want them just to see a concrete jungle. So then, well, also the representatives show, show the folks community, show them history, show them that it was more than a concrete jungle. Now I say ongoing damage from 2006 to September to run for president for the Republican Party of the United States will not win the election. The second candidate will win the election. That's Abraham Lincoln. The first candidate is John C. Fremont. John C. Fremont is born here in Yamcar in the 1800s. His father is French. His mother's from a Virginia family. So what's happening in Yamcar in the 1800s? You got the French, the Irish, the Germans, and the Scots in Yamcar with the African. But what happened? The powers of being Savannah realized something. They're like, you can't have them around them. So what they realize that poor people or oppressed people will realize who's causing them to be poor or oppressed, they'll come against them. Mm. So they say to the French, to the Irish, to the Germans, to the Scots, you're not like them, get out of there. So Fremont's family will eventually leave Savannah and they go to Charleston. And during the Civil War, he will issue his own Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War, two years before Lincoln. They go time to cut, but so we're just worrying about that right there. Because he was an abolitionist, we make our way. There, see the black owned businesses over there? Oh, that's what you spilled there. Wow. Yeah. 1950, 1960. Yeah, I guess they're wiping out. They never think about homes and businesses that are right here that were owned by us.
How you All doing? right, how you doing? A friend of mine. He lives in Illinois now. And we were on our vehicle then. And I, I'm with him and his kids, and I'm talking about, yeah, I'm across. So we ride over there, and I'm talking about homes, business over here. And he said, Oh, Mama, you want to see you up in Yamacra? But we kept saying she grew up in the project. She kept saying, no, she grew up in the house. I said, see, you ain't believe your own mama. So, because that's what it is. So many people, they'll never think. If somebody tried to tell them, like, no, this is us right here. They're like, no, this is how, again, how they got their minds locked up. Only this right here. You forget about, again, that spatial memory. Forget about the rest of the story. And that, to your right, that is called economic resegregation, better known as regentrification. It's that the river first, then hit Indian Street, hit the new construction. That's why when you were talking about you wanted to see, I'm like, that's what it is. So I'll just give you the cheese. Because we do that on that journey. That's, no, that's the first thing you said when we, we came up this street when we first got in. He said, look, gentrification right that's there. Right, that's right. Now we call it economic resegregation. That's what wow. it's called. Economic resegregation. And Savannah is a majority black city. When you're in the tourist area, you want to realize that. But step out the tourist areas, guess what? See how the young hand project is okay? Going down there too. I'm the black man who's going all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. Can you speak even about this housing project? It looked it looked bad to me on all the team. Uh, there's a few housing projects I've seen that haven't been updated. Can you speak that what's the name of it? Why is it the way it looking? Are they talking about um doing something with the proper way it looks? Why you gotta be like that? <laughs> I don't know why you, why you, you just, you just, you just gonna go with it. And, um... Well, hold on, before you go any further, I'm from New York, we had a bunch of projects that was like this, they tore them down, and it made it look like something unfortunate. <laughs> it was reaching the end, because a lot of people, they pushed out, they can't afford the standards and everything required, it became harder, so that wasn't a good, good thing for us, but, He won't even let me do what I need to do. Oh, right. as long as he just, 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 That's what always happens. Everybody got to go on Lil Jamal's journey. Everybody got to go on the journey. <laughs> I just just drove. I just go for the ride along with it. You say we can ask questions. You say. You say this ain't your mom and daddy tour. So why you trying to be all like that? <laughs> Jamal, you must be a hypocrite. Or you just be lying. I thought you said you are honest company. You lying right now. You're real all through the project. You know, we don't know what's going on. It's going AK and shoot. <laughs> I don't go to nobody project like that. Oh, well, good thing you're a general, because you're a general. Anybody else? Like, man, we ain't going on. I'm sure ain't knew we ain't meant to this project. We bad for all that wild deer project and kept moving. We don't play with nobody hood. We don't play with nobody hood. I don't care if you be. Savannah, New Orleans, New York, we don't pass y'all up and do this. <laughs> <laughs> he got to be a general, boy. This is a problem. He's 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 a problem. You enter through the back, you go into the clinic, you enter through the parking lot. But the building that's in front of you is a copy of, a replica of, the mansion house on the Hermitage Plantation. This is a big house on the plantation, done in 1940. In 2015, we come through here and I got the, a professor from Yale. When I come through, I said, this is a big house on the plantation. He didn't ask the question. He said, what about these buildings here? I cut them off. These are the quarters on the plantation. They remade the plantation in 1940. Wow. This is diabolical, baby. This plantation wrote, baby. So they wipe out an independent black community recreate the plantation in 1940. You can't make this up. Wow. So they're hitting the psychologist saying, this is all that you all are, this all too shall be. 
So what happened over there in 2006, like I said, that's a snowball. That's what they've been hitting us since 1940. So this so, is a plantation. This is a replica of the plantation. So the plantation was right there? No, the plantation, no. Uh -uh. Oh. The hermitage was down the river, but they wiped it out. They got rid of the hermitage, but they, guess what they said they're going to do? Oh, when they said we're going to put up some projects, this is all we know we're going to do. We're going to take over that black community, wipe out, wipe, take the homes from the black people over there. Then we're going to give them a public house development that looks just like the plantation. Mm. They want to say, if these buildings were single story buildings, you got the exact quarters in the plantation. So I said, this is diabolical. That's why I said, I just want, you asked me that question. I want, I want yeah, you to come right. over here and yeah. I want you now to see how this thing is destructive. You can't make this stuff up. So here you go, leaders of politics, leaders of religion, leaders of finance, leaders of business, leaders of education don't have a clue about this until they take a journey with me or when I do a presentation. They're like, oh my God, Jamal. So I said, that this ain't no accident right here. This was intentional. So they wipe out a black community to recreate the plantation. Mm -hmm. Unlike other places in Savannah, we got no plantation museums here. But I had somebody go say, but we got to recreate the plantation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is what this is. And so why I have you walk through, that, walk through the plaza? It's just like how it was on the plantation that you got you got this wide open space that people then walk up to them houses like that. They remember the whole oh, thing. Sure. Yeah. They had some entertainment. The entertainment was performed by a group called the Hermitage Singers. <laughs> Basically wow. the plantation singers. Wow. Like I said, they gotta hit you. And so that's what becomes that's why I said that becomes part of that false reality for us. Yeah. And historic Yamacraw before all this right here. That's a it ain't completely out of my house, but something goes to a squirrel. I've never seen it in my life. Mm -hmm. So Oh he he's he like, mm-mm. He said nope, mm-mm. But historic Gamma Crawl was in the minds of black America like Harlem. James Robin Johnson, composer of Lift Every Voice and Sang, the Black National Anthem, wrote a poem about this community during the Harlem Renaissance titled Go Down Death. He talked about Johnson and Death Down to Ram Georgia and to Yama Crawl to get Sister Caroline, that good and faithful servant. And there are two schools of jazz pianists in the US. The Jelly Roll Morton School out of New Orleans and the James P. Johnson squad in New York. James P. Johnson writes what he called a Negro Rhapsody during the Hall of Renaissance that's titled Yama Crawl. That he said is dedicated to the men from the Sea Islands of Georgia. And he said Yama Crawl is a Negro settlement on the outside of Savannah. So he got historic Yama Crawl in the minds of black America like Harlem. But you would never realize any of that that they based on the federal government city of Savannah did back in the 1950s, 1940s. Mm. And you look to your left. The past the warehouse on the upside warehouse is River Street in the river. Then you look to your right. You look all the way down the street, look past the traffic light to the very end of the street. Then you look back up the MLK Junior Boulevard and then back to the bottom. That was Yamaha. She was a huge black community. Yeah. But you ain't realizing any of that right now. Yeah, wiped it on out. So this is a huge black community. So we made that there is a child that was born on St. Simon's Island, Georgia. St. Simon's 50 minutes away from here, right on the coast. Mm -hmm. And he's raised in historic Yamaha and historic Woodsville. Woodsville is another historic black neighborhood, two neighborhoods in back of us. And he goes to the West Broad Street School here in Savannah and to the Beach Institute also here in Savannah. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to Clapham University in Ardbrook, South Carolina, but then he transferred to Hampton. Then he'll get his undergrad from Hampton. Then he goes to the Kent Law School in Chicago. And he gets his law degree, and he's now practicing law up north in Topeka, Kansas. But he'd be told it is not possible for a black man to earn a living as an attorney up north. So this is the turn of the century, 1900. So his stepfather here has a school here called the African Union School. His stepfather also has a newspaper business called the Woodsville Times. So he's working in the newspaper business and in the school. But he finds the sign, I ain't saying this about I'm going back up north. So he goes back up north and starts his own newspaper business. So he had sent his papers back to the South, and they have asked the people said, leave the South, come up North. No longer face discrimination, come for jobs. And it set off in part what you know in American history is the black migration under black exodus. The newspaper is the Chicago Defender newspaper, founded by Robert Sinstack Abbott. Robert Abbott will now help cause one out of seven black folks to now leave the South and go up North. They go to Danbury, Hartford, New York, 
Philly, Detroit, but he want to get folks to come to Chicago. He called it the Great Northern Migration. So when they go to Chicago, they go to a historic black neighborhood they call Low End. Today they call it Bronzeville. And in Bronzeville they have children. Then the children have children. Then some of the children's children move out of Bronzeville into Hyde Park. And in Hyde Park, they meet a man right next to the Harrow's Chicken Shack. Elect him state senator in Illinois, Barack Obama. And in 2016, I have a member of the Sinsai family with me. She said, Jamal, you tell people that. I said, yeah, I tell folks that. They said, that's what Barack had said. He had never been president if it was not for Robinson Stack Avenue, the Chicago Defender newspaper. See how one person changed the entire world we live in. And I said, imagine you tell the children out here that type of information. That now empowers them to understand that they got the power to change the world. But if you don't want them to get that information, then guess what? You let the conditions here go down. And so now to go to something else you say about what the condition of the place, the House Authority of Savannah was given $2.3 million to renovate here. And you see the renovation? You see the renovation? Y'all see the renovation? The Housing Authority of Savannah is looking to upgrade a longtime public housing complex downtown. Demolition plans are in the works for Yamacraw Village, built back in 1941. WSAB News News' Ricardo Lewis went to that neighborhood tonight to check out the conditions firsthand and has a look at what's next for the project. I feel like they just need to go ahead and tear it down and build it back up. Neighbors who live in this area say they're tired of living in homes that are 80 years old. Elizabeth Halbert recently moved in. Everything's falling apart. Ceilings, just the whole nine. She says mold is an issue. Her doors and windows don't lock properly and the bathtub is falling apart. This is what to be in your bath water when you run in the water. A physical needs assessment done by the Housing Authority of Savannah has the board agreeing on demolition. The Housing Authority is hoping to submit an application for demolition to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development by late summer or early fall. It would take $40 million to bring the current 315 apartments up to a quality standard. HUD says when it costs that much, your property is eligible according to Section 18 for demolition. I think the ball was dropped by the Housing Authority. District 2 Alderman Dietrich Leggett believes as time has gone on, upgrades should have already been happening. What we have here is a form of what we say demolition by neglect. And when I use that, that term and the definition of that is just don't do nothing, allow it to dilapidate and the powers that be are just get tired of looking at it and we'll sell it or we'll tear it down. Davis says the housing authority has not neglected these homes. There just hasn't been enough money coming in from HUD for major repairs. The requirement is that we rehouse everyone who lives here. Families that have lived here for more than two years are eligible for a voucher and those who have lived here for less time will be placed in current public housing. In Savannah, Ricardo Lewis, WSAV. Other people will call them out about that. That alleged, that was it. They, they $2.3 million. You see boarded up structures and all this around here? Yeah. So like that, yeah, but that's what it comes down to. When people are trying to destroy the folks here, and they, even sometimes they begin to look like you. When I share some of y'all, I say, even people who look like us don't respect us. Mm -hmm. And I say, because they don't love themselves. That's mm -hmm. why they do that. Mm -hmm. And craziness. So now I ask this question to y'all, and I'm kind of scared to ask y'all this question. Don't rob us, man. We got number 10 dollars in our pocket. No, I, I, I. <laughs> <laughs> this one here, he bring that null and stuff here. I said, I gotta ask him a question. He said, don't rob us, man. We ain't got the ten dollars in our pocket. They ain't even that. Just because, because we, because we in the community with us, the black folks, boy. I was gonna ask a question. I'm scared to ask him a question. That's why I said I'm scared to ask him a question. I was gonna ask him, what is the largest black parade in the United States? The largest black parade? Mm -hmm. Okay. Jamaica. Oh, see, cause see, I, I'm happy, cause see, you know, cause they're from New Orleans. Some people like talking Mardi Gras. I ain't no Mardi Gras. Oh, <laughs> well, we know that's all white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is the Bud Billiken Parade. Oh. And I see Bud Billiken folks from Chicago say, "I was a Bud Billiken queen. I was a Bud Billiken king." It's a children's parade down in Chicago every August. That is the largest black parade in the United States. Bud Billiken is a fictional character created by Robert Sinstack Abbott. The Bud Billiken is a patron saint for children, for the newspaper boys of the Chicago Defender and other children. Children from Africa used to write to the Bud Billiken. And so that's the largest black parade, because the background behind this is Robert Abbott said that when he grew up in historic Savannah and historic Yamacraw and Woodsville, he said on Sundays after church, they have ice cream socials for the kids, they have ice cream for the kids. So what he understood, 
for us to thrive and survive as a people, you got to take care of the children. So I have people from Chicago, I said, y'all would never thought y'all tied to the Plaza of Savannah, did you? <laughs> make our way on back. But then Franklin. Franklin was a supporter of the colony of Georgia. And an agent for the colony of Georgia. Just like other squares have nicknames, I give them a square nickname of Haitian Square. to the city of Savannah, dedicated to the Chasseur de Vantes of San Domingo, San Domingo. San Domingo, San Domingo, today is now known as I to Haiti. Between 500 and 800, the Franchi, free milk, come from Haiti and fight in the American Revolution for the United States to become a nation. School kids in Haiti know what happened in Savannah, but most Americans lived there all their lives and died with nothing about it. And what did they fight? 301 MLK Jr. Boulevard, Savannah Visitor Center at Battlefield Park. All that is sickly in the black history of the entire world, and most Americans know nothing about it at all. And this mine is put here by the Haitian American Historical Society out of Miami, along with the assistance of eight men at the city of Savannah. And all the figures on the monument are symbolic figures. But the one we point out first always, the one the drum. That represents the only king that will come out the American Revolution. The only king that will come out the American Revolution is an African king. He'll be a 14 year old drummer during the battle get wounded in the battle, and let it go back to Haiti and help Haiti become the first black nation in the world. Some folks said, oh yeah, the Haitians defeat the French. But no, the Haitians defeat the French, the British, and the Spanish. He was an island, black folks defeated three European powers, and U.S. are too scared to get involved. But the U.S. realized something, they said, wait a minute, we got more black folks held in captivity south than what's on that island. And Europeans would have said, we have more black folks held in captivity in Cali than what's on that island. And they all say, never let those African the South or the colonists ever connect with them on the island. Why is that? We failed in the United States. We failed in Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, Jamaica, Curacao, Brazil. All of us failed. The only black folks who won their freedom in the entire Americas were the Haitians. People never understanding why Haiti has been treated where it has for 200 years, representing an ideal for the Africans and Americans. If you stop fighting for your freedom, you win your freedom, you unify, you have a nation state. So we've been making Haiti pay since 1804. And the drummer represents King Henri Christophe, the only king that will come out the American Revolution. What we tell folks this, we are the only tour company in Savannah that can say that we're connected to minus in the city of Savannah. I was one of the eight men in the city, bringing this monument to the city of Savannah. They've had me go to Haiti, Miami, other parts of Florida to get the history. They use me as a model for the figure that's in the back, but the rifle pointed in the air represents the historian, the one who must tell the history. I tell folks, I don't throw that out of the brag, but to show people this, when you know your history, it will take you to a place you can never imagine. Never would I imagine as a little boy on Hilton Head Island, Savannah, Georgia, growing up by me knowing history, I'd be on a monument. And there are three tourist areas in the city of Savannah, three tourist areas. Broughton Street, which is our major downtown street, that's where that first traffic light is. It's been our major downtown street since the 1700s. That's the third tourist area. City Market is the second tourist area. Bruce Street is the first tourist area. And all the music have a local black presence. No longer the case today. The Goss of Broad Street 2010, City Market 1990s. And this is commercial regentrification. It's not just residential, it's also commercial. <laughs> City 
Market Market was an agricultural area before it turned into a tourist area. Some of the buildings here and business in City Market. We have buildings, business, and a lot of houses. We have restaurants here, barber shops, shoe shop business, tie stores, and seafood markets just in the neighborhood. The building, the orange, onyx, silver, silk, and beans, that was owned by Reverend Williams with Amy Minister. We had this produce business right over there. And if you had walked past the window back in the 50s and 60s, you would saw Biddy's in the window. Y'all familiar with Biddy's? Baby Chicken. That comes from a key Congo word, an African word, bitty bitty, that means chicken. Some folks say pretty, so I thought that meant old woman, old hen, or girl. I said, see how crazy we're using the English coming from African origin, and they say that old bitty get my nerves. Then I have folks out in New York say, Jamal, we said that's a fly bitty over there. And then something the word itty bitty. Then linguistically, Africans are lying. Today we do own a few businesses here, but we don't have the power, they cannot power on the bill that we used to. Belfast Restaurant was staying the fire like four weeks ago. Uh, that's called on by brother Kevin McPherson. He's the chef and co-owner. Silver Silver Bees are owned by Sister Gwen Jones right here. Up top, Sister Sabrina has a Gala Gallery up top. William from Manor Falls from Ghana, he has a Gallery up top. Sonny Robinson also. Then below you got Alice Baptiste from IT right there. And then Sister Jerry, Sister Diane over here. So you make our way. Go to the next block. Okay. That is Johnson Square. Johnson Square is the largest square in the city of Savannah. Banks have been on Johnson Square since the 1700s. So it has the nickname of Banker Square. And the block of the Andaz Hotel, the Blue Green Condo, the parking garage, entrance over there, that's where they have brokers and speculators. Brokers and speculators. And to your left, you see the parking garage, or, I mean the parking lot over there. And so over there, and that's the parking garage over there too. That's where they have brokers and speculators. The Golden Brown building was a bank right there and a broker business right there. And City Market today, like I say, consists of two blocks. But the original City Market was on the square. It was a large two-story structure. But they tore it down in 1954, put up a parking garage, then tore that down, created this green space we know as Ellis Square today. So this down created this green space we know as Ellis Square today. And if you had come into Savannah back in the early 1900s, you've been told by African Americans not to walk in the most evil area in Savannah. As most Savannahs where it's the most evil area, they don't have a clue. It's the block we just walked through. Just like today we have a house closing, you have attorneys, banks, and real estate agents involved in the sale of the property. We didn't involve the selling of Africans. You have attorneys, banks, brokers, and notaries involved. The sale of Africans alone in Savannah in 1862 brought in over $2 million between attorneys, banks, brokers, and notaries. We're talking about $2 million in 1862 terms, which is $53 million in today's terms. And that's why I tell folks the wealthy United States is tied to Africans. Not about what they grow, but to who they are human assets. And see that three-story brown brick building right there? On the third floor, there's another Negro march right there. Another Negro march is right there. And on the first level of the building, there's an African man who is hired out. And in fact, you all know who he is. Whenever you hear about African being hired out, have to see yourself. That's a person held in captivity that's operating their own business. And the man, like I said, who has his own business right there, he has a butcher shop and grocery store on the first level. You saw his name down at first Bryant. That is Reverend Ulysses House. He has his own push shop and grocery store right there. So let me tell you about his fixed expenses in the 1800s. He paid his own rent for the building, paid for his own meat, his own fruits, his own vegetables, his own inventory, and had to send back to the man who held him in captivity $50 a month. So people say, black people don't operate business. I'm like, you don't know your history. He still had to maintain a profit with regards to all of that. Again, I said, so you know your story, you know better than scared off that craziness. But they interviewed Reverend House in the 1870s and they asked him a question. They said, What took place on the third floor of the building that you had your business in? And that's when he said, You can never get out your memory. The chains of the shackles going up and down, going up the steps and along the streets, and hearing the children wail for their parents and the parents wail for their children. He said, Those times were hell, those times were hell. And they said that when they were interviewing him, they said his eyes began to shine. I tell you, you know his eyes were shining. 
for his crime. And they said that he had his, fence, his hands closed and they were trembling. So now y'all got an idea why that block was called the most evil area in Savannah. Folks still remember even the early 1900s what took place right there. You see what happened, you'll tell your story continually. But that's one part of the story about the building right there. When Sherman arrives in Savannah, our ancestors, two weeks later, will start their own school system. Their own school system. They pay for their own superintendent, their own principals, their own teachers, and secure their own buildings. This building once known as the Bryan Street March was not turned to the Bryan Free School. They teach the children during the day, they teach the adults at night. And when Northern writers come down here, they go inside the building. This you can see it inside the classroom, you can see the chains and the shackles on the walls of the classroom that the children are being taught in. And as I tell folks, our older ancestors were sing a message to our younger ancestors. Basically tell them that we, we will never return back to that. You'll get your education. And when Northern teachers came down here, they began to ask our ancestors, they say, why aren't you all sending your children to us to teach them? That's what they say. Your stands for our children are here. Our stands for our children are here. So here go black folks coming out of captivity, expecting more for their children, but many people expect today. And you do have access to the third floor of the building today. It's the model home for the timeshares now. <laughs> so when you went to Blue Green Condos in Savannah, they take you up there to see the interior. Yeah. Now I see you can walk around here. Brokers and speculators over here. They're called Negro brokers and Negro speculators. Some people say, oh, they were black. I'm like, no, they're involved in selling black people. So no matter what they tell you about Savannah, they tell you that Savannah is the cotton capital of the world. We're the cotton capital of the world. But guess what? Savannah makes millions of us on cotton. But Savannah made more millions of us selling human beings. Again, we are making millions of us selling cotton and lumber. But guess what? More millions are made off of selling human beings. We don't have to have that type of conversation. When I listen to y'all, we got the brokers over here, Negro, oh, they're called Negro brokers and Negro speculators right here. That's right, all these blocks right here. Yeah, all these buildings to your left and to your right, they're all new construction, 2000, 2000 teams. All this to your left and to your right, 2000, 2000 teams. We're making our way to the water now. Here, other places called alleys, but we call them lanes here. We're gonna make our way to Bay Street. Okay, I saw that on the map, Bay Lane. So I tell folks, one of the better ways that you see history and culture is through food. And I had interned in DC at People for the American Way. And when I was in DC, I was NAM. NAM and Governments to Eat. That's N Y A M. Go to Jamaica to say NAM, and Guyana to say NAM. And in Panama, they say "nam go," which means eat and go away. And every day in DC, I would nam boneless ham. I tell people I love eating boneless ham. Y'all feel it, boneless ham? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what is that? What is boneless ham? Boneless ham. Yeah, boneless ham. That's that smell. That thing. Watermelon. Here's the name go. Got a cell phone that right here. <laughs> Some parts of Virginia, they call it Georgia ham or Georgia candy. Go to some other parts of the South, they call it July ham, August ham, or garden ham. The other thing in DC, I eat every day were gooba. Y'all ever heard of gooba? Go to the movies and eat goobers, chocolate covered peanuts. So they take the African word gooba and anglicize it to goober. So what you call Southern cuisine, Low Country cuisine, American cuisine is African cuisine. So our food ways. People fix a dish called gumbo. Gumbo comes from a plant called ingumba, key gumba, ingumbo. But you know the other African name of the plant, okra. The airway people in West Africa have a dish called capelli, or good kinke. The golf people call the same dish capelli. Capelli or kinke is a bit of fermented cornbread. And in Kenya and Uganda, they have a plant called sukoma wiki, which is equivalent to greens. I tell you, you know how some people the pot looking for make greens, they get the cornbread and put it on the green, on the greens itself. Like in Fufu in West Africa. They cook in Guinness in Africa. Guinness is a nickname for chicken. Cooking seafood in Africa. And here we fix a dish here called red rice. Go to West Africa, they call it jollof rice or jollof rice. Some call it chepien. And I had a gentleman from Nigeria. 
we're gonna go this way right up here. And let, I let him sample some red rice here. He said, we fix our jollof rice with tomato paste and rice. How do y'all fix your red rice? I said, we fix our red rice with tomato paste and rice. Same thing. Hoppin' John, that's some people say, how you fix your Hoppin' John? Because Hoppin' John is an African fish. Black eyed peas also come to America via Africa. But some people use the field peas or the red peas. Because our ancestors said the red peas and red beans were good luck peas and beans. That's why Hoppin' John is a good luck dish. So again, so here goes the food that we eat. Now I say, black people, your culture is with you all the time. The very stuff you eat almost every day of your life. Act like you ain't connected to your story. And you look up top, see some of the Mets and faith. And pearl, that means herbal knowledge. See the Spanish moss hanging from the trees. Suffer from high blood pressure. Take Spanish moss hanging from the trees. Put it in your shoes to bring down your blood pressure. Suffer from asthma. Take Spanish moss. Put it in a pillow, make it to a pillow, help the gods to ask. Take the bark of the oak tree, round it up, make it to a tea, help the gods to digest. Mm. And during the fall and the spring of the year, people call it a spring tonic or a fall tonic. What is that? Sassafras to help clean you out. Mm. And then some of you use pine tar. Then I have some folks going to say, uh, a young brother in his 20s last year, last August, said, my grandma gave me timber town on the sugar cube. And in February, I had a brother, he and his wife, and the brother said, he was working for a pharmaceutical company. He said, Jamal, every season my wife give our kids timber town and honey. So where did timber town come from? Pine trees. Some people have wax myrtle trees as hedges around their homes. Pick leaves in a wax myrtle tree, ball them up, rub it on the skin, insect repellent. And if you have a weeping willow tree, you have a headache, get a branch of a tree of it, shave it down, chew on it, ask me. And in fact, and in April, I had a group of people on Sunday afternoon, we're doing a journey, and I shared this with brother out of DC, said, my neighbor has a weeping willow tree in his yard. He said, every day he's even eating a leaf. He said, why are you doing that? He said, never have a headache. And he said, now nah, listening to you. I'm like, yeah, you're right on point. So what do we call all that today? Holistic medicine. So the big guy answers coming from Africa with these skill sets. And they couple information with European information, they American information. Yeah. And that's our city hall tour. I love it. We'll go just beyond the city hall. I'll show y'all something. Then we'll make our way to the war. 1700s. And we, in fact, today have the fourth business ocean container port in the entire United States. Los Angeles and Long Beach are first and second. New York, New Jersey is third. Savannah is fourth. So we've been a major player. That three-story great building across by City Hall, that is the U.S. Custom House right there. Okay, like I said, we're a major player. We're gonna go just beyond the City Hall, show y'all something. And this is our City Hall right here. The first street in Savannah is River Street. That's the first street in Savannah. The second street is Back to Wall. Back to Wall is on the side of the wall right there. It's the street of Savannah all their lives have died. They don't know why it's called Back to Wall. In a couple of seconds, you might learn why it's called Back to Wall. Factories, we think of places you manufacture and make something. Now, I'm saying, it's about holding areas. 
And what are the commodities of modern culture? Africa, black and gold, or black eyes? Your answer. The fact is that they place African women in have to take trenches in them so their blood could flow out to the ocean. African men kept inside factories where they put up feces they kept in. They have children dungeons and children factories. Not only do they call them factories, they also call them zoo made houses. Houses of darkness where they allow no light to come in to condition our ancestors for the joining of the boat. Also called the fair of food. Across the street we the office of the factory. They can say cotton, rice, indigo, lava, maybe with the human commodity going up and down this block. This structure place in Savannah in the 1840s also made out Savannah Great Prince. And often have people talk the Middle Passage. So the men's people died in the Middle Passage. I tell them, psst, that ain't nothing. We do pay homage to the great folks of all time. Our answer did not survive the Middle Passage. And um, but I tell folks this. If you went into a village, took a family ten out in Africa, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, big. One, two, three, all the other spot into the back. Then one or two of them got in the passage. So I tell people this. If you see a person of African descent, only the best of the best survive, and two few black folks in the Americas understand, they are descendants of the best of the best. I said, when you understand that, you carry yourself differently. Treat each other differently, spend more peace out of brothers and sisters. And I had a family of eight, I think, for the so going on back on six years ago. I came for people with the so they came inside here. But they were behind. They went behind. They were on the outside going, King Cole, King Cole, King Cole. I'm like, okay, our family, good things. Most of them down West Africa. This is Jamal. We just went to Cape Coast last July to the Tupac. This is Cape Coast. Reminds of our own nation. So what I tell folks is if you never make it to Africa, there's a place you can come to in the U.S. and see something reminiscent that your ancestors saw in Africa here in Savannah, Georgia. And that's what I used to share that I had with Matiga, St. Croix, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Puerto Rico, Tortuga, St. Vincent, and Monster all of us all just around the city of And the placards of the car located all along here, I tied to one of my tours with kids. For nine years, I brought kids inside here. The kids started saying, why are cars parking inside here? This should be a place of respect and reverence. And guess what then happened? Two 12-year-olds and three 14-year-olds, African-American males, go before the city council Savannah and make all that happen right there. Come on, young people, I said, when you give them history, they will soar. When you give them mythology, that's when they turn the tag. And in 2017, the city council gave those five young black men a preservation award. We are in Rita Benin, West Africa. And when they bring some of my answers up, the fact was there, the zooming houses there, they marched past the Catholic Church first. Then they marched the women around one tree seven times. They marched the men around that same tree nine times. That's called the tree of forgetting, for them to forget who they are. Then they marched all around another tree three times. That's called the tree of return, saying no matter where they take it in the world, when they die, the souls return back to Africa. And if you go to Rita today, the tree of return stands, but the tree of forgiveness would cut down because it said, no one should forget. And we're still in Africa. Because our ancestors, they're being marched to the boats in the water. You see, after they fall down to the beach sand, they start grabbing sand and stepping in their mouths. I always ask folks, you all know why they were doing that? You know what's up? No. Did not know where they were going to be taken in the world. They wanted to take a piece of Africa with them. Mm -hmm. So the only place where I'm put it for them to stand desperate. So I tell folks, imagine seeing 50, seeing 100, seeing 1,000 black horses in chains, not grabbing sand and stepping in their mouths and crying. they have been taken to boats on the wall. I said, that goes to show you the love that our ancestors had for Africa. The same love we're supposed to have for it, and the same love we're supposed to have for each other. Uh, what happened? I got a cousin of mine named Dion. He lives, he's from Portland, Oregon, but he lives in uh, Jacksonville now. He's done about three journeys with me. So the first time he ever did a journey, he heard that he was Jamal. He said, Every gang banger need to take this tour. So he understood about him being from Portland and stuff, saying how people, you know, not having any love for one another, not having any respect for one another. Yeah, we take each other out indiscriminately.
This is the African American Family Monument, dedicated to the African family in America. You see the mother, the father, the son, the daughter, and the son is looking down the river, he's looking back home to Africa, much like the tree of return. This is placed in July 2002. The inscription was done by Maya Andrew for the mine specifically. And on July 26, 2019, we did a dedication of the plaque below to Dr. Abigail Jordan, the inspiration behind the mine. Too much all. Yeah, mine is taking a shot.